internet. Gino, that Pinguino Brieco here again with another episode of Deep Listens, and I'm joined as always by Billy. My name is Mono. I am the Doodle King. Rothert. Um, sure. Okay, so uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. My name is Billy Rothert, a.k.a. Rothgar. I, um, I am so happy to be talking about the the best sequel to Pokemon Stadium we've ever played. And we are also joined, as always, by Peter. My name is Mono. I am the Doodle King, Fuzzby. <laughs> so all we need is about, like, three more guests, and then we'll have enough Doodle Kings to set up a whole podcast. Yes, then we'll have as many Doodle Kings as the game we played, Magic Pendule, colon, the quest for color. What a game, people. And we're going to have a lot to talk about. The bottom. But first, before we get into that, before we get into feedback, Pete, how are you doing? How's your arm? Doing good. It it bends for the most part. I do have to wear. I'll show you guys. So if you a if, brace for well, this, a few weeks, listeners, months. Yeah, Pete just had some some elbow surgery, which decommissioned him. Which sent that is why he was not on our first Persona podcast. He did not have two functional arms. No, I couldn't use my fingers, but now I can. Fingers. Nothing can stop you. Pendul. So now my question is, if you, like, do a quarter circle and hit all three buttons, do you do your super called bionic arm? No, like, well, are, are you Spencer? I didn't have a wife for them to kill to, like, build a bionic arm for myself. But I'm, I'm hoping the next arm surgery I'll be married and I can murder my wife for that. We can, right, great. We should play yeah. that. Up, we should play that bionic commando at some point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Man. <laughs> Yeah, you and JJ Watt, you got your your elbow, your weird mechanical elbow braces. So now let's get to feedback because we have some. We have at least one piece of feedback for the general show, and this comes from someone who dis- who goes by bigger than Pete. Lies again. Lies. Well, maybe true at the moment, but post convalescence, once again, will be false. Yeah, once. But then again, you've just added a mechanical part to yourself, That's true. so. That's true. I'm augmented. I'm upgraded now. That's fair. So, Bigger Than Pete says, I broke out the PS1 this weekend and played the first half of Castlevania Symphony of the Night for the first time in years, and I remembered why. I loved it growing up. Do you think there is enough there to do a full episode on it? I know you're not really doing retro games right now, but it would definitely, I would definitely like to hear what the Deep Listens crew has to say about it. I think that's how we read it. Um, Pete, you're up next. What do you think about Bigger Than Pete's suggestion that we play Symphony of Night? Well, look, I I think I know Bigger Than Pete personally, and I won't, you know, shout out his name on the podcast or anything because maybe he doesn't want it out there. But from what we can tell from his username, he's obviously a liar. And I'm not going to play a liar's games. I'm not going to let him run my life. That's so fair. At but, least, yeah. but listeners, I would say just because this person, you know, I don't know them, but they may or may not be full of hot dog shit. Doesn't mean you shouldn't write us in and say, hey, you know, this is one of my favorite games. I'd love to hear your take on it. You know, Deep Crew, can you guys just, you know, talk about this game? Because I think it'd be really awesome. Absolutely. Yes. Those kind of requests would be would be welcome. So Very the, much appreciated. That part of the question I'm happy to answer. I've played Castlevania Symphony of Night. Billy, you have as well. Has, has everyone here yes. played it? I've not. Well, uh, sorry, I have played a part of it. I have not finished that game. Okay, I've I've gotten ninety percent of the way through, like to the end of. There's a there's a twist. I don't want to spoil it then if you don't know what it is, but um, yeah, that game's really good. It is up there with Super Metroid as the best. It is the Vania in the Metroid Vania when we talk about that as a genre. It is actually just like Symphony of, Symphony of the Night is generally the game you mean. It's the best Castlevania game. It's really good. Sometime and sometime when I don't have to act tough and shoot down this individual, we you know we very well might get to it, but it won't impact my reputation as a tough guy. That is accurate. The Castlevania game that I played the most of, I believe, was Circle of the Moon. These are great titles, by the way. They have a lot of great titles in the Castlevania series. I mean, it's no mm-hmm. Pendul, the Search for Color, but that's true. It's no Magic Pendul, the Quest for Color. So. Just, I want to say this before we get into uh, even more discussion. Um, if you hear anything wonky with my voice, 
I am getting over a illness, so that is affecting my ability to talk. I'm probably going to be using the cough button more than normal, but you won't know that because I'm a professional. So, as we all are, if you want to have a uh, feedback read on the show, please send an email at deeplistenspodcast at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Twitter at deeplistenspod or at that penguino, or go ahead and use our comment sections, deeplistens.lipson.com. So, Magic Pendulum, the quest for color. Billy, take it away. What um, a game. Yeah. I. I want to take this game away. <laughs> Everyone has tried to play. No luck. I, overall, Magic Pendulum Quest for Color, a lot of fun. Um, let's get into the story. We we open the just title screen. As soon as you hit new game, like select new game, we get like a great like children's music. Like, intro, fantastic, you know, depiction of colorful artwork and, like, a great theme song. And I'm like, this game's fucking lit. Like, this game just just lit. (laughs) Fucking lit. I am so ready. There was, like, there was just, like, wholesome family music. There was a bouncing red ball. Bouncing red balls. A wholesome children's game. And then Billy's first instinct is, time to get turned. Let's get after it. And then we gain control of the protagonist. Uh-oh. Um, Hard and, turn. <laughs> and then everything just gets bad. No, so, okay. Uh, the story here we have. Uh, an unnamed, genderless, but I think there's hints enough that it's a male protagonist. Um, uh, and we actually never see the protagonist either. Um, that's that's kind of an interesting turn for the game is that we are always playing in this kind of interesting second person point of view. So we gain control of our protagonist. A mysterious voice reaches out to us from the ether of our mind darkness um, where this game eventually turns to. And they say, hey, you know what? You can create doodles. Start drawing things. They'll come to life. And you're like, sweet, I'm in. So you... Wake up on this mountain top cliffside, cliffside. beach situation, cliffside, um, uh, reminiscent of like a Kingdom Hearts opener. Actually, like I felt a lot of Kingdom Hearts vibes from this like beachside opening sequence. And you're introduced to a couple of characters early on. The protagonist, who you get to name, my character, you meet... my dude was named. Ah! <laughs> Just all right. A's. Sure. Just all A's. No, I think there were some caps and some lowercase. No, they were sure. all caps. They were, they were all caps? Great. What were your, guys, what were your character's name? <laughs> Mine was uh, all capital B's. It was just... <laughs> Billy, please say uh, you were cap- all capital C's. <laughs> no. Chad. <laughs> it, was, it was just all C's, and then the last, you know, three letters were H-A-D. <laughs> Chad. Chad. No, 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 no. I think I named my character Rothgar because um, I'm mine vanilla was, like that mine was Steve Whenever we haven't talked about like any of the story Steve. yet holy shit okay so you meet Zoe are, and Taro right you meet you meet Zoe and Taro but you begin this like brief tutorial of drawing your first pe- uh, your, your first creation and then like the second half of the opening cutscene happens where there's more singing more merriment and fun time and like balls bouncing around it's just it's fucking great do we know we if that dog the- from the beginning of the game is a doodle or a real dog I don't I hope I hope it's both or neither I don't know I both I don't know I, ho- I think it's a doodle I think it's a doodle. I had to guess. I think I think it's a doodle. Um, so here's the actual story. There was so this kind of like color deity and a king. Um, okay. Did Did you not hear that part? I did, yeah. but I blocked it out of my memory. Yeah, there's this like magical deity of color, and there's a king. Yep. Um, originally, everybody who creates doodles can have those doodles come to life. Um, But eventually these doodles are sort of harnessed by this king with, with a bad heart and, and, and and people are forced to create doodles um, for the, for the, for, for for the king's own ill gotten gains. Oh no. You know, not, not, 
the good gains that Pete very admirably gets Mm -hmm. when his elbow gets back into shape. But, you know, it's those ill-gotten gains. And this color deity says to, like, the great bigger deity in the sky, hey, um, I will give back all of my color and and my life so that only good-hearted people can make doodles come to life. And the bigger, uh, greater super color deity says okay sure and takes its color and its life and then the god of the doodles sacrifices itself so that only good people can make doodles and now we get to present day where the king is from what we learned in like the very first five minutes like enslaving people and forcing them to make doodles for him and it's just a hot shit show there's like competitions where people will create doodles and fight them but it's kind of amicable and friendly kind of like pokemon situation you know yeah, like doodles seem to be okay love of the sport um but also when you win you get color which is the lifeblood of these doodles and then the government will come and tax you of like we're taking some of this doodle color because that's how this this government works i'm sorry but you haven't earned the right to draw arms yet <laughs> yeah so um <laughs> We 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 meet we meet Zoe and Taro, two of the first characters that we get in this game, and they take us through actually like a pretty fun and reasonable tutorial sequence that like introduces the, us. What's up? What would the what would the like whimsical term for child orphan homeless child orphan be? Would it be like ragamuffins? Um, um, I, I believe think... the term is Final Fantasy protagonist. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's the official <laughs> term. Um. They start by having us do like just some friendly competitions, initial doodles. I think but urchin get... is actually I think it's urchin. Urchin, yeah, that'd be good. They're or two street, urchins, yes, you street urchin or Star street Wars rat. protagonist. It's any yeah, I mean, hero. Budding. Hero. Well, I was gonna say budding Batman, but he was about as far from homeless as you can get. Yeah, I, I think once you got someone who is homeless and jovial, you just assume protagonist. Yeah. So trying to get into the actual meat and potatoes here of the story as 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 weird and colorful as as it's it is so weird. You Very meet cool. a couple you meet a couple of people there's like a nice village a nice town here but you do interact with the king and the king's army and you meet what is presented to you as the central antagonist of the game this 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 king this government this army that is um <clears throat> through illicit means forcibly creating these doodles for their own gains uh, a few good-hearted people are able to create doodles and they do so lovingly and rec- and recreationally and life is peaceful and good um, things get weird when the two children allies you have uh, Zoe and Taro begin a search for um, their their lost father who was one of the most famous doodlers in all the land and eventually they will come to grips with uh, some of their past, some of their history, some of the lore around doodle making, and eventually come to face and eventually defeat the doodle king himself. I'm and doodle and king. thus begins the story of Magic Pendulum Cole in the quest for color. Yes. So let's let's start with the mechanics a little bit. Now that we're now that we're grounded in this very grounded game uh, that deals with a lot of hot topics. So. First question, were you able to draw anything that wasn't a nightmare? <laughs> yes. N- no. Um, I drew, so uh, I will say <laughs> that it's very easy to draw nightmares. <laughs> yes. It's very <laughs> expedious. Yeah, the game actively encourages you to just draw yes. chaos mares. Just nightmare fuel Pokemon. I drew an upside down panda. <laughs> and by, by upside down panda, someone my sister asked me to draw a rhombus for the body, and she said she also wanted it to be a panda. So I put its head on the bottom of the rhombus, wrapped its legs all out of the top till they hit the ground, and then uh, she wanted arms. She wanted cigar arms coming out of its face. Okay. It was a nightmare. So you know. I think your sister's drawing from her own nightmares at this point. <laughs> My first two or three doodles, I drew a bird, but the problem was I screwed up the x-axis and the z-axis, 
so it was facing the wrong direction? <laughs> it was facing always the left direction. It was always in profile. Oh, bird. I did. But you don't get access to wings until you're like... It was just the bird's, bird's body. body. Oh, okay. The wings were arms. The wings were, yeah. <laughs> the wings were arms. But the problem was the bird, the head and everything was facing one direction, and the arms felt they should be going straight ahead. So... <laughs> The body was always a profile, but the arms Dude, were It was kind of like weird undulation, like crab walking at all times. Describe to me your doodles, your favorite your favorite doodle that you drew. Well, um, well you know, <clears throat> as soon as I can make more than one doodle, I did. That's so good, my you have to make first, at least three. Yes. Uh, and only three. Yeah. Um, you really shouldn't make more than three doodles. You should just kind of keep turning it into more and more of like an abomination. Yeah. Um, you don't make specific... additional doodles. You just make more of the same doodle. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a mechanical reason for that that I find kind of a drawback of the game, and I will talk about that later. But um, my best doodle, I think, was kind of looked like the stereotypical robot from like classic 80 like like 60s 70s 80s like sci-fi of like boxy torso like claw hands and like a and like and like a dome head situation yeah like the clamps the clamps, it's clamps. Like, see like the legs were weird because like i drew it one of them kind of funny so one was more of a spine than a leg <laughs> Oh no! And he kind of walked like with like a weird like gimp, but it was sort of like his spine was coming out and using that as the other. It was just it was wonderful. Everything else kind of worked almost reasonably, um, except the head would slide around sometimes because it tried to do like gestures. But that should have been a fixed thing in place. Um, it was almost like the headpiece that I drew was was really just neck and nothing else. So when I did it, I was still, you know, fighting for the use of my fingers, but I had enough sufficient fingers to do it. So my my response to pretty much any of the drawing portions was just more tentacles. Yeah, <laughs> there was there was a circular body of some sort. And then when I had arms, oh, tentacles, legs, more tentacles, wings, more tentacles, flying tentacles. So it was just this weird like octopus ball radiating tentacles in every direction. Because <laughs> honestly, the easiest thing to draw is a tentacle. So, yeah. And mechanically, the problem is, this game does not reward you for having constrained vision. Your doodle's stats are based entirely on what colors it is and how and much how color much. there is. Like Jackson Pollock would be the best Pendrel player, I think, of all time. Now, I will say, I need to jump in for Magic Pendle's defense here. I tried to make some really good-looking doodles, and I did, but I did it too late in the game. Did you buy um, new brushes? Well, like, I got upgrades and shit, like, yeah. of course. Where do you get um, money? I never got money, any money. You trade in color. Oh. You can I, trade color for money. I just had a bunch of color. I mean, you can like, basically grind for color just by doing, like, little battles and stuff yeah, and you you're trading color for money so um if you want to be really artistic and create a really well-made doodle this game actually will, will will respond pretty fucking well and animate this thing yeah. appropriately it's actually there's really no good reward. there's no gameplay reward but i can tell the developers of this game put a lot of work into something that could have been really beautiful but the way the game encourages you to play is just turn it into a fucking shit storm and just dump more color into it and, and it's going to be a spaghetti monster and it's going to be a magic user. So uh, it's going to be great. I wonder, too, if if the enemies were created using like the actual in-game creation like modes. Because like, some of the final bosses, especially you fight, are pretty complicated. Like Their colors are really interesting. I wonder if like the developers actually built it using like the same tools the the player would use. I'm not sure because actually, interesting fun fact, some of the enemy designs were designed by Studio Ghibli, the famous Japanese... Ooh, really? yeah, yeah, I could see that. That makes movie sense company. now you say um, When they say like doodler and some of the enemies you fight, it'll say like doodler name on the bottom of the screen. Yeah. 
if they say G Lee, oh, like that, it's the name of the actual people who created the doodle. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Or or an alias. So some of them say like Ghibli, and that that means that they were designed by Studio Ghibli. So I don't know if they use the tools, but also they're super talented, and gi- given enough time, I I could imagine a talented 3D artist being able to come up with something using the tools. Yeah. Ghibli's just kick ass. Like they just do cool stuff. So sure. Yeah, I mean, they if you throw have. enough time and expertise against this tool set, I, you can make some cool things. I, I just, I couldn't. I made some. I tried for some things that were not nightmares. Like I made a knife snake. Oh yeah, that's not a nightmare at all. And that was pretty good. It was a snake. A fl- was it a flying knife snake? A no. Snake with knives or a snake made of knives? <laughs> snake. It was a snake with, so it was a snake body, a big S at some point, and then I gave it four legs, and then six arms, and one of the arms had a knife. So you violated, like, the only rule of snake. Yes. There's one rule of snake, a little limb, and you're like, to hell with it, give him ten. Well, the game <laughs> requires you to use a ton of color at the end if you want the stats to be any good at all. Yeah, sure. And I couldn't give it more spines. You could have made it all hard. I could have. I guess the other option was to cover it in spines. Could have made it spines. all wiggle. I, I added a lot of wiggle to like most of my now, early see, things. Now, see, we're not just making up words. This is actually names of body yeah, parts. Yeah, these are actually designed. You design can add features. pieces of a creature that's called hard and pieces of a creature that's called wiggle and soft and, and rotate and soft and rotate. Yep. And whip isn't whip one of them too, or is wiggle and whip the same one? Wiggle. No, there's wiggle soft. Well, I think whip is the attack that wiggle does. Yes, there's yeah. weapon, yeah. Um, design, which is just like drawing on the thing. It's how you make faces. There's wings, arms, you don't make legs. Face. Everything I made had a face. No, well, mine, mine had too many tentacles. There's nowhere to put a face. That's fair. Uh, most of mine also included a cry for help drawn on their body in some location. <laughs> Please murder me. <laughs> It gets pretty Cronenberg pretty fast. <laughs> Just said one of my so the panda nightmare that I drew, um, I drew on the back of it. Help. Panda nightmare that I drew. Like regular pandas can't even breed on their own, and you made some monstrosity. I drew help me on the back of him, and his name was help me exclamation <laughs> point. The only color that it had was a wobbly red dick on top. Because they're pandas, they can't. Did you make it out of wiggle or out of hard? Wiggle. It's a panda. Like, you don't want. It's a panda. A hard panda. So it was a flaccid. It was more of a flaccid. <laughs> a fl- flaccid, a flaccid piece of. It wiggle. was very large. But I'm sure. That's where it's. It mad. is a bear, after all. That's where its defensive prowess came from. Right. So now that we've talked about the drawing mechanics, the, the drawings actually. They managed to make some garbage animate in a semi-realistic way. Yeah. At no point was I like, this doesn't look... I mean, it always looks weird. That's not how that the soft dick would wiggle on its head. It always animated exactly like you thought it would. Well, no. That's how I pictured it. Like, I... It did for me. I know. The funniest thing I saw was Jen... It, my wife wanted to draw something she wanted to draw a butterfly and i hadn't unlocked wings yet and so what happened was she used arms instead of wings and so it just assumed that the the first point of contact with the body was the joint so the whole wing just like moved up and down instead of being attached at all points <laughs> and then she drew when i got wings she then drew a second set of wings tracing over the set of arms and those wings, those wings also did not stay attached at all points. They also articulated on the same spot. So it just has it four was really wobbly... like a dragonfly. No, because it didn't fly. It still hopped around. It rise on the ground. Oh. It hopped around. So it sort of like dragged itself across the ground. It hopped. Like it. Okay. And it had four just writhing limbs flying around its head. She drew legs on the arms, and when you draw legs on arms and they don't touch the ground, they, they're basically nothing. It, uh, 
if you want to see what that looks like, go ahead, look at my Twitter, at that penguino. I posted a video of, of our nightmare. You know, in a lot of ways, I mean, the story is going to get real dark really soon, but in a lot of ways, this is one of the funnier games we've played. Yeah. Uh, you know what? This game's kind of a delight. Now, yeah. we're going to say some mean <laughs> things when we get to the combat. Oh, yeah, we're going to get, we're going to say a lot of mean things. <laughs> um, I'll say that like the seaside village or whatever that we start the game in super well made. Like I like a lot of, I like a lot of things about how that place is built. I feel like it's a very livable place except for that whole flesh market situation. Yeah. Did you see the flesh store or the, uh, the seafood flesh, the flesh seafood? No, <laughs> just they misspell fresh. I think. Oh, so it's flesh. It says yeah, it flesh. was like mistranslated or something. So wherever it said fresh, it just said flesh. Well, so, based on the intro montage, right? So you saw like oxen pulling the field. So it made it seem like like all the animals in this world are doodles. So if you're going to get any protein, it would have to be plant based. And I think you doodle plants, or you're eating people. I don't know, but it said flesh. And every time I walk by, I go high flesh, high flesh market. Might be full of cannibals. Who's to say? That's, you know, it remains to be seen, but almost all of these merchants will just sell you a doodle. Yeah. Yeah. But they all Instead suck. of actually anything useful. Yeah, they're terrible doodles. And <clears throat> I mean, I enjoy talking to all the little Until citizens. you ruin them, aka make them great. Yeah. Some of the doodles are decent, like starting points, because. They seem to have access to the ability to draw shapes I just can't manage, like triangles. I can't I can't make it do that. I don't know how they did it. And they can also sell you brushes that like draw a little bit, you know, are a little bit yeah, better at drawing finer shapes. Detailed. Um there was a way you could sort of like gimmick yourself into drawing really nice um polygons, which was I don't know if you guys knew this, but if you are drawing a shape and it and it has the ability to become convex and closed off, um, it'll just auto-complete for you. So yeah. that, that made it really nice to form like a straight edge on things if you wanted to. Are they polygons? Are polygons three-dimensional or two-dimensional? Three-dimensional. You draw them in 2D and they become 3D. Yeah, they become 3D. Not right. just one so D. when We're you're awesome. drawing, yeah, by, by definition, polygon means many angled. And so... Both two-dimensional objects and three-dimensional objects meet that requirement. Okay. Sounds good. But yeah, it, that town, it's bright, it's colorful. All the characters are really, they animate Different. well. They have like a little bit more going on than I expected. Like some of them seem to interact with each other. They, I mean, they have different was functions. A, it's like a well-made root town. Yeah, it's a shame you, know, you have to walk through it every time you want to get to any, not. and you move very slowly. I don't know. I didn't mind the movement. I just wish that it didn't make me sick. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if I try to be too fancy with it. Yeah. If you just kind of make it a boring kind of movement, you're fine. But as soon as you try to control it to make it kind of elegant or fun, you 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 kind of face the potential problem of getting nauseous. I'll explain sort of how this movement works. So you, in this sort of second-person point of view, are not really a person traveling through a town. You are. You're just looking through the eyes, but always in front of you is your pen gel, which is some kind of, like, sprite fairy situation that you sort of... I just imagine you, like, crushing it in your grasp as you, like, squeeze ink off of right, it. Right, Alex, how does it work? Because it does the drawing, technically. Yes. And it's got brushes on its head. As appendages... <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. And are they named after gel pens? Like, it's like a mistranslation yes. of gel pens? Yes. Okay. Not mistranslation. It's a copyrightable gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. use of gel pen. Yep. I just assume um, that you grab it in your hand, you dip it in some ink, and you say, hey, buddy, you're going to be here a while. <laughs> like, this is happening. The original, um, the, the original name of the game, I believe, in Japanese was called Doodle Kingdom. That's a good um, name too. Yeah, it was just called Doodle Kingdom, and then it was, and then it was sequeled by Graffiti Kingdom. So it, it makes a little more sense. Yeah. Um, but magic, but magic, magic gel pen. The quest for color is what we got stuck with here. 
much like you got stuck with all of your first three doodles because you can never really change them off of that. I let's yeah, let's let let's hammer out some more. Do, do you guys want to do story combat or like me, or like mechanics? Let's talk about the combat because all right, let's talk about the combat. So the combat is, is rocks paper scissor, but there's a with four other option. weird thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So the way it works, you've got attack, you've got magic, and you've got block. Attack beats block. Block beats magic. Magic beats attack. And then the fourth option is charge. Mm-hmm. Charge heals you. And then your next move is extra strong. And you can never use the same move twice in a row. That's it. And you can never use charge on the first move. That's it. Yeah. So that's the entirety of Magic Pendulum. You can win any battle as long as you keep winning the rocks, paper, scissors. Though it is pretty difficult if you have an underpowered character because a charge can then heal more than the damage you can deal. And so... It can become like a terrible, terrible Sisyphean nightmare. But at the end of the day, it is just rocks, paper, scissors. So the combat gets slightly more complex when you try to actually be good and win, as opposed to just throwing out random uh, com- combinations. So there is a strategy, and if you get good at it, you can basically never lose. Um, the only the only thing that gets weird is that <clears throat> um, your very very first action in the game is a true rock paper scissors. After that, you've basically got everything available to you, and there's always a right choice to make. So, doesn't matter what your first move is. If you win or lose, it really doesn't matter that much. Your second move should always be charge. And then after that, you can sort of play the game by uh, playing the odds and sort of hedging your bets. This only gets reset if your opponent charges and then you throw out like another move. And then after that, you just charge in response and you, then you continue the cycle. Because if you win at rock, paper, scissors, your opponent just does no damage to you. So if you throw out attack and they have thrown out block you just stomp on their ass and they don't even get to do anything that turn. You've just dealt a very one-sided bit of damage and then it's the next turn. Um, Since your opponent has just blocked, they cannot block next turn, which means that you cannot lose if you choose magic the next turn because magic would be the only thing that beats your block. They're either going to throw out magic or charge or attack, or attack and respond. And if or they attack, choose attack, you just blow them out. You just hard win. You just blow them out again. If you if they charge or block, you sorry. If they charge or magic, you either um, beat them if you have higher agility, or you get a free attack and they get to heal. And then they'll hurt you a little bit more later. But them charging still allows you to then just immediately charge, mitigate the damage, and then you go right back into the cycle yeah. that you just did. The only so <clears throat> your pendulums can have different stat. They have different specialties. There are some pendulums that are attack based, some that are magic based, some that are block based. Those different types determine what they're better at, but also in some cases actually change their move set. So if you're attack based, your block ability will just be called block. You'll just do some damage when you successfully block a magic attack, and then your your it's weird because if you block and they don't do anything that squashes your block or runs directly into it, then you shoot your like block shield at them. And depending on which version you get, you get a different attack. Um, if you're magic-based, your block move is a magic shield. So when your opponent attacks you if with a magic attack, if you have a magic shield up, you damage them and you also steal MP. You, you absorb the MP from the attack which helps keep your magic character charged. And then if you're a block type, your block reflects. So if you get hit with a spell when you're blocking, it actually reflects the effect of the spell back at whoever cast it. And every magic spell... It has like spell, a status debuff. Yeah. yeah, every magic spell has an associated status debuff, which is kind of crazy. Um, but if you can bounce a debuff back at your opponent, 
sometimes that, that will just like end the battle because some of the debuffs are wildly overpowered and some of them are basically do nothing. Which means that if you end up with a character who has faint, one, two, three, four, or five. Faint is the best that I found. Faint gives you two free turns. If you hit someone with a faint spell and it successfully status affects them, they will be incapacitated for two turns and you just get to wail on them with no no retaliation. Yeah. And these fights don't go that long. <laughs> they most don't. Of the time. Like two turns is a whole lot. Yeah. Most of them like you can kill most enemies in three attacks. And if you successfully landed the faint, there's one attack. And then you just hit them twice. And then you get two more. So my strategy was basically for any fight that mattered, I put my magic user last. And then I just hoped that the last hit would be a block from one of my opponents killing my, my second to last doodle. And then my magic user would come in, has faint ready to go, and they can't block it. And I just immediately hit it. They die on they die on the spot, and then the fight's done. Thank you, Butterfly Abomination, for having me. <laughs> four. Thank you, Butterfly Abomination. Um, so the, the there's there's a little bit more to this as well. The type of doodle that you make, whether it is block, magic, or attack, also unlocks like the best. It gives them access to the to, to, to the best moves in that genre in that type of move set. Um, it's also determined by how, uh, by like what what kind of pieces are on your doodle. So, for example, um, there's a move called Chomp. I believe it's called Chomp, and it requires your doodle to have a mouth and a horn of some uh, of, uh, of of some sort, um, and also a particular like attack stat. It the the doodle having these moves are not having them makes a couple of different checks about what, what what the doodle actually is it checks what pieces are on it how much of it there is what color it might be what its doodle um type is like attack block or magic it checks a lot of things so over the course of a game your doodle can evolve quite a bit and fill lots of different roles as you sort of gain your own um style or flavor in this world of magic pendule now the weird thing is so attack Attack and block are just single choices. You're going to either attack or block, and then whatever you pick. Like, when you pick an attack, your doodle might have, like, five different attacks it can do, but you don't pick which one happens. Magic, you pick the exact spell that happens every time. And you can have, I think, up to four. Yeah, you have four. And so that means that if you're a magic type, you just have a lot more options, generally speaking. Uh, my attack types and block types generally had like two spells, and both of them were garbage. And then my magic types just had four spells. All of them were awesome. And then if I landed any of them, my opponent was very dead very quickly. And so I think that attack <clears throat> is capable of doing the most damage in a single burst, because attacks just seem to do way more damage than anything else. Block against magic types, because if you had a block type, you can reflect spells back. Landing a key block can swing a match, but that's only because their spells were so good that your block type is, is advantageous. Block types are only as good as the attacks they are blocking. And then magic types are just OP. Well, block types are also meat shields. They're pretty tanky. Yeah, but not tanky enough to like offset. Because their natural predator is the, the attack type, and they're extra damaging. So, so the I, I kind of looked at... Um... I kind of looked at block types, and I, I played a little bit of... I, I shouldn't say this publicly. I, I played a little bit of, like, Gen 1 Pokemon kind of competitively, but not really. And so when you're coming Gen up with, like, one. a... Who plays Gen 1 Pokemon competitively? Like pe people that like to play the the most broken Pokemon. It's hard out here. Yeah. And well, so anyway... Um, a lot of people would put like a Snorlax or a Chansey on their lineup because they're just a normal type and they just soak damage. They're not particularly great at killing somebody else, but they can sort of war of, like war of attrition down yeah. some yeah, of you the more that Chansey seismic toss. <clears throat> go man. Um, and she's got um, uh, sorry. You would give you like your block pendule would fill the role of dealing with some of the more agile or fragile characters and I usually had my block pencil as my number two. Um 
I would either have my magic or my attack, because I had one of each. I would either have my magic or my attack pendulum as number one, and the other was three, and block was almost always number two. Because if I, um, if I lost, I would probably lose to one of the other two, either attack or magic. I wouldn't usually lose to a block pendulum. So um, if I had to switch out, I would either switch to a block for a magic user that killed me, and then you'd get, I would annihilate them, or I'd switch to a magic user for an attack that killed me. So I had pretty good options with opening up, um, with block being number two and my attack and magic being one and, one and three, respectively. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of strategy. We're, we are making it sound like there's way more strategy than there is. Ultimately, there's not, if you screw no. up rocks, paper, scissors, you lose. If lose. you're... If your doodles were very good and you screw up rocks, paper, scissors, you lose. Well, that's not 100% true because if you, the only time that actually matters if it's the very first round and you can't charge. No, I mean if you continue to screw up. Oh, yeah. If you continue to screw up, yes, you just lose hard. Yeah. Like, there's a way to basically never screw up, though. There's ways to pretty – yeah, to never really, really badly screw up. But if you if you just make bad choices, you will get – beat down real hard and i like, actually think the types didn't seem to matter all that much to me because you could if i had my way i would just have three dudes all of whom have faint four and then i just win it seemed to never fail to make them faint um i think the most times i lost if i ever did was when like my opponents just tied me all the time and did like a hard reset it is only if they were like copycatting all my moves and then it came down to agility and sometimes my pendules were not as agile so they would get to attack first and that would only really matter if it was low health and i was like well i guess it's going to come down come down to agility i need to not force a tie and hope i force the wins so i'd have to take like a more of a coin flip um yeah, attack and pattern so <clears throat> it's to say there is more depth here than you would think on first glance, but not enough to say keep the game interesting for the entirety of its duration. Yeah. Right. It's <clears throat> it's very interesting and cool for like two hours. This is a There'll game. There'll never be a, a pendul competitive scene. Like that'll just never emerge. I guess what I would say is this game would have, if there was online multiplayer, it would have helped this game a whole lot if there was some way to have better multiplayer because playing against the AI isn't that fun. No. But also, this game doesn't have the depth either way, I don't think. I don't think you can play this game high-level competitive for that long. No. It'd be cool just to, like, like in just an, oh, man, what's going to pop up next sort of way. But beyond that, like, novelty. Like, so, what other hellscape am I going to get to see yeah. that somebody else made? How many tentacles is this thing going to have? What other penis monster am I going to fight? Basically, what I'm saying is, wait for it, Evo 2017. Let's see Magic yeah. Pendulum on the main stage. How long <laughs> do you think Magic Pendul would take before it turned into chat roulette and it's just dicks? Just I mean, dicks. there was like a, a dick monster that I saw in the regular game made by actual developers. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that one. It was like a tan thing that like bounced up and down. It, it, was, it looked like a dick with sunglasses on and arms. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And I was like, well, okay, if the devs don't care, I don't care. Yeah. They're leaning into it. All right. So I want to transition into one of the biggest problems that I had with this game. It's sort of related to the doodle creation and combat. Um, <clears throat> uh, to draw just like a brief comparison to Pokemon, if you think about your starter Pokemon and how much that choice affects your gameplay it's kind of similar to your first doodles. Um, for a lot of casual Pokemon players, your starter stays in your squad for the whole game. And they're almost always your best Pokemon because they've gotten the most EXP, they're the most advanced. And if you just, I mean, if your goal is to win, you might as well just throw out the best Pokemon you have every fight, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get this scenario where, you know, a lot of casual players or young players will play a Pokemon game and their starter Pokemon will be like level 80 and everybody else is level 20 because they just always fed the 
the the the starter on the line. Charizard got to eat, man. Yeah. Now this sort of happens in Magic Pendulum. You are encouraged to make other doodles, but it's actively a bad choice to do so because the experience that you get from all your fights applies to those specific pendules that were in the sorry those specific doodles that were in the fight. Don't you, you ever make those, mistake pendules and doodles again? You're right. <laughs> um, that was my terrible mistake because because pendules are actually very reasonable and kind of cute, and doodles are nightmare scape. So, um, the first three doodles I made, I felt like I was actually stuck. I made those three doodles when I only had body and hardness parts to use. So they were really dumb looking. And as I unlocked more and more body parts and colors, I could make them more interesting, but I couldn't really start over. I couldn't start fresh because if you start over a new doodle, it doesn't really keep any of the new experience it's a whole new doodle you're basically starting the game over and there's no ability to delete like you can only undo and redo no you can delete a doodle you can delete the whole doodle but you no. what i'm saying is it's not like you can go oh i I, those legs are bad let me just get rid of these legs and make it taller like there's no editing there's just undo back and then redo gino can you edit a living thing (laughs) <laughs> that's a good know. point you know I can't undo a living thing either but you can undo all the way you can undo back to a neutral state uh, um, so question you can undo even after you finish the doodle and you've saved it yes yeah you can uh, you, you can undo it to the ground basically but yeah. you have to redo so it you basically ha- you basically have to do that it makes you it makes you have to either restart your entire doodle, which is what you do to make it look not like a nightmare monster or more like a nightmare monster, whatever you choose. Um, but you can only have three doodles. And I think that limits a lot of what the game would ask. Of. I think that's limiting a lot of what the game has to offer, because if you're stuck with three doodles for the whole game, it lets you make like eight or nine or something like that in your book or something. Let's you make six. Six? Yeah, sorry. I didn't count because it didn't fucking matter. Um, it lets you make more, but you shouldn't. Because no. if you want to actually scale properly through the game, you're stuck with three. And that limited a lot of the options. Like, I I had to have my squad, and that was it. And I just happened to have a block and attack and a magic. But if I wanted to have another one of each, they would just be vastly underpowered and basically useless. They do do a good job of early on kind of giving you colors in a specific order. So you will kind of end up with an attack, Mm -hmm. a block, and a magic just by playing normally. Uh, Yeah, so while Gino's voice is just going to shit, um, uh, you can elaborate a little bit and say, yeah, there there are some colors will aim more towards magic, block, or attack. And if you wanted to rebuild your squad, you could. But I didn't want to have to say, oh, you know, I'm going to this part of the game. I really want to have two magics and one block. Like, I didn't want to have to rebuild my doodle and just recolor everything. I I didn't want to have to do that. So I made sure that I had one attack, one block, and one magic, and they were all as good as possible. The base stats of your doodle are largely dependent just upon how much color you use. Sorry, how how many color gems you put into it, so how much substance there is, how many monads of color make it up, and what type of color it is. Those are like the base stats. And then it's EXP takes care of the rest about how much it scales in either of those directions. So you can make small changes to your doodle, that actually like cross it over the 51% mark and now it's a block doodle or now it's a whatever and it's moves that can drastically change. That was cool because I could recolor a doodle and I got to the point where I'd have like a piece of my doodle as one thing and if I, I might have just deleted it and redrew it, it'd have a whole new move set. That's and I kind of cool. exploited that for some, for, for some parts of the game because it was just enough on the equilibrium – that uh, if I like deleted a part or I re- or I redrew it a different color, I could go between like attack or block or attack or magic or something like that, and that was cool. I liked that. I ended up through drawing more parts of that doodle, which you have to do to make it just better and keep up with the game. I lost that ability. I tried to get it back, but I I couldn't make it balanced enough. I I didn't fully understand all of the color to doodle type ratios, 
but I had it to where I could change one part's color and it would be a different doodle, and that was really cool. I, I couldn't replicate that again towards the end of the game. So I want to I want to talk about some other problems this game has. Um, one, the movement's very slow. Like you said, the camera's not great. This game begs for a fast travel because every time you want the save is at one. There's like Four locations in the entire game. Four or five screens you need that you can go to. On one end is the tournament arena where you fight 90% of the battles that you need to fight, the mandatory ones for the story. On the other side is the little hut where you can save and where you can draw where you can draw. You're basically just going fight, go all the way back, save, draw. Go all the way back, fight all the way back and it's just over and over and over again they, they eventually start mixing it up with other places that you need to go but 90% of the game it felt like was me going up or down those steps getting to I mean stuff. slight exaggeration but I would say like I spent out of the like 8 or 10 hours that I played this game probably 2 in travel that's a lot just like walking back and forth, like third, like twenty five percent of this game was just me like shuttling myself back and forth from my save point. Yeah, it's quite a lot. And another problem: this game has it has like no menus. I, I, I've never seen a game that has this few UI like components. I kept hitting buttons, expecting something to pop up, and it just never did. You, there's no pause screen. There's the buttons only do things. There's a save room, and then you can put down your little drawing book. But otherwise, nothing. It's weird. You don't need any more than that, Gino. I guess you not. You don't need any more than that. Nope. My character didn't need a body. You're spo- Maybe you're supposed to draw your own menus, and we just never figured out how. Shit. Also, did yeah. you guys find that the music is sparse in this game? Like, in some spots, there's music all the time. And then in other spots, it's just silent. Yeah... I didn't notice it until you mentioned it because the there there's not silence when you're fighting and stuff. There's no. not silence when you're in combat, and that's I guess what I focus on the most. Um, I think when you're usually when you're in when you're like by uh, Zoe and Taro's house, it's like silent. When you go into the village, there's music. When you go into the arena, on the way to the arena, like on the way to the actual battle, silent. Get into the battle, music. And then there are a couple locations that have music, but I've never right, seen a game. Are, it feels like this game was put together with shoestrings and bubblegum. There are the one, no, it was doodled. All right, that's how, that's how this game was made. The one that, that got was, me was the guard. When you talk to the guard right before going into the arena, none of like the the stuff is voice acted until the last line. When he just what is it? Are you ready to begin? Like it's something yep. generic like that. The voice acting is not bad in this game. It's just very weirdly put in. No, I, no it's bad too. Weirdly apl- I, I don't. I didn't find it to be bad voice acting. I, I found it to be uh, a game that was clearly not an English game first. So it feels like it was sort of like a dubbed anime where maybe yeah. the voices doesn't the voice doesn't perfectly match, but like the voice actors did a good enough job. They just didn't have enough fucking lines to read. Like they only. Some- they only got to voice act 10% of what the game was actually talking about. Yeah, so I think Zoe did a good job. I think Taro was fine. Mono was terrible. He didn't have yeah. a lot to do. And then all I could see every time any of the characters spoke was a producer just like, please uh, read the lines as they're written. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but I don't think, I don't think my character would say it. Like this. Also, I don't think people would. Like anyone would. <laughs> um, like this isn't the way a thing talks. I don't. Uh, I don't see. As written. What's please. your job? What's As your job written, title? Please. Voice actor. Uh, mine's writer. So uh, <laughs> just read what I wrote. Thank you. <laughs> and there were so many scenes where it's just like, what are these people talking about? And then there's the scenes. Guys, we got to talk about the story now because of the voice acting. I can't properly discuss the voice acting. So, at first, Taro and Zoe, it seems like it's going to be like this fun, upbeat adventure. Uh, We're going to the tournament. We're going to... We're just going to have fun drawing time. Don't learn about doodles and friendship. 
Things are going to stay light. And then cops show up. Kingdom cops. Marshals. They show up and they go, hey, we're taking your shack. (laughs) The land you live on, we're taking it from you. Now, Zoe is probably like 12. And Taro is probably like 8, it feels like. It started to with the sign the marshals put on their property that said thieves basically will forfeit their property and lives. Yes. Thieves will forfeit their property and lives. And their children. Their children just try to live on the this like abandoned shack and they like orphan children. I love that the orphan that Zoe like takes the sign down and then cuts it into a board to repair the shack. And then they start telling you about how their dad's missing. I thought that was actually one of the most badass parts of the game. Yeah, that was pretty great. Zoe's great. I mean, she was like, yeah, you know what, Sign, Fuck you. I, I, I live what's inside sign of you now. Do? <laughs> I live inside of you now, Sign. Zoe, what's the sign say? It says, use to fix your home. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, actually, she said that. Yeah, yeah, I, right? yeah, she, yeah I was I'm quoting right. the game. It, it's it uh, used to fix your house. That's pretty great. And then they start talking about how their dad's missing, but they just yeah. call him Galileo. They don't you figure out later that he's their dad. And it turns out that like a little bit later, this mysterious blonde kid with blue eyes shows up and he starts talking some crazy anime bullshit yeah. about how he was he was raised by Galileo and he just tells him, Yo, your dad's dead. <laughs> by the way. By the way, uh, your dad drew me. And I'm a doodle, and your dad's dead. And Zoe's like, I, he's coming back. He's not dead. And she starts throwing like bottles to her dad, like it, into the into the ocean, and they're never gonna come back. Apparently, that's how they can because like Galileo was getting the bottles. I guess. Like Mo yes. said, he saved the bottles. Yeah. Well, well, hang hang on. I think that the way I interpreted it was first she was throwing bottles in the ocean before we met Mono. Yes. Yeah. That was how that they was their main method of communi- of communication. I don't know if Galileo got the bottles ever. We don't know if Galileo actually got any of the bottles. We just know that Mono got the bottles. So it's open to interpretation that perhaps, yes, you learned that Galileo passed away. It is confirmed by Mono. You don't quite know wh- when or like how far apart the death of galileo or the creation of 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 mono and he and and him getting the bottles it's all kind of convoluted you don't really see into that part of the game yeah um or you do very very briefly yeah you get you get a flashback where mono tells you you about get a snippet about galileo basically on his deathbed like teaching mono his his pinocchio son uh to feel because he's a doodle and he can't feel and so he learns He learns what sadness is when uh, his dad dies. And then uh, he comes back, and it turns out Mono is a very special doodle. Some might say he's the doodle king. Some might. Mostly he, Mono. He has the ability to steal color from things or give yeah. it back. So he can take color from the grass and make color gems. Or color from humans that offend him and displease him. <laughs> it's basically like that old Twilight Zone episode. Where that one kid is basically God, and everybody has to make sure he's happy all the time. That or oh, yeah, is that I, a Star I Trek? I remember episode? that one. Yeah, there's a Star Trek episode like that, so I'm not sure if it's it's probably both. But there's a Mono does not use it for murderous intent all that much, though. Uh, there is <laughs> all that much. There is one time where I think a marshal, like Zoe's in his way, and so he like hits Zoe. Or something, yeah. or, or offends her, and then Mono just starts using his power on the dude, and he's doing the like he starts doing like the Darth like Vader, yeah. yeah, the Darth Vader's choking me, starts stuff, and he starts losing color, and I'm just like, is is Mono just gonna murder this dude right here? <laughs> yes, he this, was he was going to until Zoe stopped him. This game is yeah. T for teen. <laughs> they're they're really taking advantage of it. But then they go to like. Their land's going to get foreclosed upon if they don't raise, like, one million... One million gold. One million gold. And so they go into an underground fighting ring (laughs) run by a criminal? (laughs) Yeah. And Mono goes in there and just whips ass. And I guess he's a doodle that can doodle. 
which is also kind of crazy. That's a little bit weird and fucked up. Yeah, and so they, that happens, and then Taro offends Zoe somehow, and they have a heart to heart, and then Zoe gets like beaten up by the guards on the steps of like the castle because she's trying to protect Mono, and she gets knocked down the stairs, and Mono like uses his hand to make a color gem, and like his hand fades away, and the color gem is used to make medicine to heal Zoe. It's, yep. and then you go to the kingdom. This is like the last. Oh, and every time you beat a uh, a round in the in the arena, you like are advancing, fighting other villagers. And this dude called Ka- Kaiba, right? Seto yeah. Kaiba comes and yeah. gives you some. Who's uh, the world's? He's the nation's greatest. It's Kiba. 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 It's Kiba. Seto Kiba <laughs> comes and he gives you different doodle parts. Parts, and he, basic. He's the greatest doodleist now that Galileo is dead. Yep. And so you go to the kingdom to avenge uh, Zoe, and because Mono has gone to the king, to the castle, to turn himself in, and you have to fight five fucking terrible monsters oh, that all say the same fucking thing. Uh, they say, I am Mono, but this is where I, I just see someone in the audio booth like, can we get another take? Can I? I'm offering to do another take. I'll ad lib. I'll just. I'll do whatever. I'll say anything else. No, because by then you know they're not. Yes, because you've like, met Mono. Mono's king. Yeah, like Mono is very obviously the Doodle King. You fight five dudes that say, "I am Mono. I am the Doodle King," and then you fight them, and then they go. Very ah! blood curdlingly. They all scream the same scream. And then they all tell you the same exposition that the game has already told you, and you've already figured out. At the very least, too, make it a different voice. Like, pick a different person. It's the same voice. Like, they didn't even need to, like, rec- they recorded it once. Yes. And then they just played it over. Yes. It's one of the craziest things I've ever seen in a video game, to have five boss fights, all with the same voice actor, saying the same lines. And then, like, a little bit of different exposition as they melt away. Like, two different lines. And then... To tell you something you already know. And then there's the best scene. You know, this game... Maybe in video game history. This game is an emotional fucking roller coaster ride. Let me tell you. Maybe the best scene I've ever seen in video game storytelling. I didn't... I didn't see any of this coming. (laughs) When When I picked this game... So, you get to the top... Of the doodle, ca- the doodle kingdom. Apparently, no one lives in the castle. It's just a like full no. of stairs. It's like a tra- I assumed it was a transmitter of some sort. I don't know. Like it's, those powers. Maybe it's full of stairs and monsters. Stairs and abominations walk its halls. Uh, no human beings. Uh, the- <laughs> when nobody's around, they all just walk around repeating, "I am the doodle king" at each other. <laughs> just reverberates off. The yeah, wall. and and this. This government, there's no, like, evidence of where these marshals live or where they come from or who's in charge. There just seems to be, like, one cop who's in charge. There seems to be, like, three cops in the whole thing. Only one talks, though. Only one talks, and they're all evil. And so when you get to the top, after you've killed all these different monsters, these abominations, these doodle king wannabes... When you beat these bison wannabes so hard that no one will want to beat bison again. You get to the top, and Mono's there, and he has, he has surrendered himself to save the shack. To save Zoe's shack. And Kiba uses his power somehow to enslave Mono and enslave sure. his yeah. heart. But then Zoe shows up, and she uses the power of love. No, she says, "Fuck you." Oh yeah, and uh, uh, oh right, a marshal, a marshal show the marshal's like, "You need to use Mono for us, Kiba." And then Kiba's like, "No, Mono, kill him." <laughs> and Mono starts just like killing this guy, sucking the color and the life out of him. And Zoe shows up, and she's like, "No, Mono, you can't do this." And then her love, her genuine affection, frees Mono. And Kiba just can't abide this. No, I don't think it, it happens. The he, greatest moment. He pulls out a gun. 
He pulls out a fucking gun. I didn't, one, I didn't think there were guns in this world. Two, <laughs> no. <laughs> what? If there are guns, why is it like a little Derringer? Three, he then fucking smokes this 12-year-old. Just shoots her right in the chest. <laughs> just blah, blah. She goes down. She's just like, Mona, no. And she just gets shot. I was like, you just fucking, you iced a 12-year-old in this rated T for teen game? What? It's amazing. It's We're the so only good. Star in the entire universe. <laughs> we have one bullet in the entire universe and used it to kill this 12-year-old. Because she's stopping you from draining all the world's color or something? A really ill-defined plan <laughs> on Kiba's part. And so that happens. And then Mono is really heartbroken by this. Because his only friend is now dead. And he erupts into, like, he drains all the color from the world. Yep. And then you have to fight him twice. So in the first fight... Uh, all of his moves kind of break the rules. It feels like yeah, they, they do way like more. Yeah. They do way more damage, and they like all of his magics just do really messed up stuff to you. But it, once he kills two of your doodles, he says quite possibly the greatest line in video game history. Um, I don't know if you guys saw it. Uh, he says, "I don't believe in feelings." <laughs> <laughs> no, I must have glossed over that one. I mean, there's so many just weird voice acting and writing lines. I guess it just got lost in the crowd of, you know, bad things that are said by random NPCs and shooting children. You know, I just I I couldn't quite maybe I didn't pick up on that one. I was still a little lost from the earlier gun murder that we would. <laughs> yeah, he just goes, I don't believe in feelings. And <laughs> clearly, the writing, the delivery, both perfect. Mwah. And then once you beat that version, he turns into like a fucking Pegasus thing or whatever. Yeah, like a horse monster of some sort. A flying horse monster. And then uh, when you beat that, he then sacrifices himself to return color to the world and to save Zoe's life, it seems like. Yeah. He jumps off a building, and he's like, no one can be Doodle King. Well, Zoe does catch him. Yeah, she catches him, but then he gives he like gives away his power enough to make his hands Oh, yeah, disappear. Zoe didn't die. Yeah. Yeah. She did get shot, though. She, it, the game very much made it seem like she was dead. She very much got shot in the chest. Yeah, they did not soft, soft play that one. No. This game's made for children, I think. This game's hardcore. Yeah. I, I'm going to be honest. I felt that bullet way more than I felt any bullet in, in most <laughs> other video games. I think it's really a testament to how... To how... Mature it, Magic Pencil the Quest uh, of Color is. How impactful the character development was that we were so attached to her. Um, I think I was going to say how well you can use gunfire in a story... But you lose that opportunity when gunfire is just flooding your game. That's true. You know? That's true. When you assume there are no guns in a universe and one pops out, pretty pretty impressive. Think about how much more poignant that one universe gun would be in the Mass Effect series. Yeah. You know, yeah. How, how much better would it be if people had to just bludgeon each other to death with their bare hands and then just Garrus showed up with the one gun? What if they were just drawing cartoony, cartoony little fun things and then someone pulls out a gun? Yeah, like, what if Ash had just shot Gary in the mouth at the beginning of Pokemon instead of dealing with his punk ass the rest of the time? It's great. I mean, it sounds I, amazing. I thought I was being incongruous when I drew a flying pterodactyl that had a gun, and his no. name his name was Bop Bop. <laughs> that was the spirit of Pendrel. And then it was like, no, it turns out I was I was a prophet. <laughs> but man, you know, this game surprised me and once she once he sacrifices himself then there's like a cutscene where zoe it's like an animated cutscene a hand-drawn cutscene where zoe and taro move on with their lives they just move away they just like oh yeah we didn't like that shack that much to begin with yeah we're gonna see the world and she says i'll be back but they never were because this game didn't get a true sequel uh what a guys what a roller coaster i'm glad i i had this game sitting on my shelf 
for 15, close to 15 years now, and I had never actually finished it. Imagine what a different person you would have been at, what, age 10 or 11 if you had seen this. It was so much better than I could have imagined. So much worse. <laughs> like, the things that I thought would be good were so much worse than I expected, but the things I had no hope for were so much better. Were incredible. Incredible. So do you guys have any any close, any other thoughts about Magic Pendul? Other than its story um, of the year? I think that this game had so much potential... And it was one of the earliest examples of a drawn to life game that I can think of. So much of it just mechanically is well built that if someone took this and made it not a hellscape, it would be this game has some great nuts and bolts. I, look, this game has zero nuts and it has one bolt. Sorry, it has just hard and wiggle. This game's got great hards and wiggles. Somebody got in a room and they were like, listen, what if you could draw your own Pokemon? And they were like, brilliant. We don't need to discuss this any further. That was the only idea they had. And they leaned hard into it. And the animation was good and everything else was terrible. And I would tell people to just go online and watch the scene where Zoe gets shot. But really, you do need to preface it with like eight or nine hours of gameplay for it to like be as, as awesome as we're making it seem. Yeah, because it's just... This game throws so much darker than it needs to. Like in Pokemon, they don't mention why there are no parents anywhere. They don't mention anything. Like the darkest Pokemon gets is in Pokemon Gold where you go to the Pokemon like graveyard. Or or the first Pokemon movie, but I mean that's not yeah. video game canon. That's more heart-wrenching as opposed to just being dark. That's, that's yeah. a good point. That's a good this point. game, you know, like, the second or third cutscene, they're like, these kids are orphans and they're going to have their homes taken away. Ain't and that By rough. the way, the cops are beating them up, too, as they tell them that. Yeah, the cops are beating them up. They're going to turn to underground, literally underground. <laughs> they are under the ground. Fighting underground animal fighting. In, with, like, a, an arena full of people cheering on the fights. Yep. It gets and they raided. Get paid in little bits of the animals. Yeah, it gets raided by the cops. They start arresting people. What the hell? What is this game? <laughs> they don't so make them I, like I, this anymore. If this game had a like <clears throat> it, it, it sort of it, it had a multiplayer, it was pretty weak, but if this game had a more fleshed out multiplayer where you could just like Draw a three pendulum line. Or sorry, I, I did it again. I confused them. Get off my podcast. A, <laughs> and you can draw just like a great three doodle lineup of anything you want with everything unlocked, and just have like a casual friend to friend battle. Great. If it had some kind of decent online component, it would be hilarious. Um, if it had a less broken, um set of three pendules or like a better design way to have like your squad or your or your team like maybe if just exp all was in effect at all times and you as the doodler really upgraded and then your doodles got better no matter what no, basically no matter what you drew i think i'd have more fun with this game if redrawing and making new doodles were actually encouraged those are the things that i would probably change the most to make this um this whole game as as a whole a win. Notice how I said nothing about the game's story, which was perfect. <laughs> perfect as is. Nothing to change. Ship it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I would have liked a little more depth of level design. Like they made a really cool world. They just didn't make enough of it. They kind of just had to stay in one area for a long time. Yeah. You you basically had like the level design of like the first harvest moon game like it seems big and nice and you'd want to live there but then you realize it's actually just like a tiny crater in someone's mind and it's 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 very limited and small yeah the one thing that i i felt that too but then inside i was always having this internal bargain if there are more locations then i'll have to play more <laughs> and that's ominous and i don't I don't want to play anymore. I just want to see that scene at the end of the game again. <laughs> well, I think that's it for Magic Pendul. What a game. I didn't... What a game. So, Pete, 
Uh, uh, remember, if you want to get in touch with the show, at Deep Listens Pod on Twitter, at that thing we know. <laughs> DeepListens.Lipson.com. You can use our comment sections. Or Deep Listens Podcast at gmail.com. So, Pete, you're up next. What do we got? So, have, yeah, having played Magic Pendle, I knew that there was no way I was going to compete with this story. Just no matter what I picked, you know, unless I picked Moby Dick or something, there's just no way it was going to hang. So I decided to go with a, a genre that's less story driven, you know, in itself. So we're going to do a platformer, slightly different, you know, platformer. We're going to play Circa Infinity, which our listeners and us are happy to know is deeply discounted on Steam right now. Yeah. So I encourage our listeners, go buy it, play along. Next time we're up will be Circa Infinity. All right. Thank you, Billy. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I feel like my life was missing something before I drew my first doodle. Um, I feel like if pendules were real, I would want one as a um, pet, but specifically to just lock it into a cage and force it to me to be to be creative for my amusement. Draw um, a key, Pendule. Draw a key. <laughs> And thanks for tuning in. I, I, I had a fun time playing this game when actually Gino and I found this game at PAX East, I think. And uh, that's when I got my copy. It was in someone's like side game shack. And Gino was like, Billy, you just need to know that this game was going to be picked at some point for the podcast. Just get just prepare your body. And nothing could have prepared me enough. for this. No amount of substance abuse or alcohol could have prepared me for what this was and i'm so glad that it's now part of my life Uh, yes thank you pete yeah once again thanks everybody for tuning in i think we all got something out of magic pendul i don't think it was necessarily what the developers intended but if it was what the developers intended there may be some of the greatest artistic geniuses of our time (laughs) it's fair (laughs) it's one of those things where it's like did did melville mean to just write a whale like textbook for like two chapters right. or is, is that part of this was good like was this supposed to be exciting i don't know what, what was he going for here some people love it and they're like no he meant this shit incredible so yes uh magic pendulum the quest for color and the moby dick of our time so till next time listeners peace <laughs>